Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your calling upon our lives. And we thank you because your calling is to make us reveal Jesus to the world. To lift up Jesus Christ. We pray once again, Lord, today that you help us to recognize that this is our calling. And that everything we do, anywhere we may be, it will be our decided purpose on changing heart attitude that we will lift up Jesus Christ. We've not done it enough. Lord, we pray you grant us the grace and the enablement and the wisdom to do it more than ever before. Help us to lift up Jesus. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come to study three in our series of leadership studies. And this morning, we concentrate, study three, on the pastor in leadership. The pastor in leadership. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If you back up to verse 7, you'll see that the word says, But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. After that it says, and he gave some. It sometimes helps us to be able to see the background of the passages we're reading. This passage, if you think through, on verse 8, you will see that verse 8 refers to an Old Testament passage. When it says in verse 8, wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and then he gave gifts unto men. He led captivity captive. And after he has accomplished that, after he has conquered, and after he has led captivity captive, after that he gave gifts unto men. Can we turn to Psalm 68? Psalm 68. Reading from verse... 16. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them. As in Sinai, 
in the holy place, thou was ascended on high. Thou was led captivity captive. Thou was received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. Back up to verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. If you read this whole chapter, Psalm 68, you will see it talking about war. Verse 14, when the Almighty scattered the kings in it, it was white as snow in Salmon. As you see that they are talking about war here, and that the king in Israel had really gone out and with chariots, with the help of God, he won the battle. War is always a dangerous thing, terrible thing. Anyone could die. Anyone could lose. Even the king could have lost. But this time glorifies the Lord because God had won victoriously for the king. And then when the king comes back to Jerusalem, Zion is a lifted up place. He goes up to Zion and then is in the view of all the people that was ascended up on high. It is spoken about the king, but then ultimately it is spoken about the almighty. Then he said, you have ascended up on high because you have led captivity captive. Those who should have taken the people of God in captivity, you have captured them and you have led them into captivity. And then the people, the enemy nations, they thought they will defeat us. They thought they will loot all our property. They thought all that we have had all these years will belong to them. But because you have conquered them, you brought back the spoil of the war. The spoil of the war may be some of the things they have taken away from us. Now you have recovered them. And also you record about more. You've got from what they have. And out of all that now, which is the reward of the war, actually, which is the, which is, uh, the spoil that they have taken from the battle, you give gifts unto men. In giving these gifts, you did not make any discrimination. Even the people that have not fought right, fought well, even the people that have not obeyed all the rules and regulations in the war, even those who have not fought according to rule, the rebellious, you get gifts unto men. Why? That the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, as we, go, as we come back to Ephesians chapter 4, it says in verse 8 again, Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. If you omit the bracket, which is verses 9 and 10, you will come straight from verse 8, you'll be coming to verse 11. And he gave some apostles, gave some prophets, Give some evangelists. Give some pastors and teachers. There are some gifts that are not very costly. There are some gifts that are very cheap. But in the passage we're reading here, Jesus faced the highest, the greatest, the most challenging of all battles. He had known about that battle from the foundation of the world. From the time he was born, his eyes or his face was set as a flint towards Jerusalem. And he knew it was going to be a real battle. And he talked about it to his disciples. His disciples never really understood. 
They never really prayed with him on it. They never really supported him. They never really helped him. Eventually, he had to get to the to get Simani. And he sweated it through. And he prayed that the will of the Lord will be done. And that he will drink the cup. And you know how he sweated. You know the prayer he prayed. But you can never sense and you can never feel the agony he went through. And eventually he went to the cross. And he said, the most agonizing thing that we ever heard Jesus say. The persecution of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's small for Jesus actually. The temptations from the devil. I think that is small. And all the things that people did against him, even the denial of Peter, when you think about it, to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's still small comparatively. But the greatest thing, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the minds of Jesus, in the relationship that Jesus had had with the Father, that would be the greatest sin that ever happened to him. That really was very terrible. But then he said it is finished. Then he conquered. He was buried. A lot of people have tried to think of what happened after he was buried. Honestly, I believe that the Bible has not revealed enough. Of all that Jesus went through. And therefore where the Bible is silent, let's be silent. Then he rose on the third day. Now, when he rose up, that's the victory. But even though we rejoice because of his resurrection, should we quickly and easily forget all that he went through? Just three days ago, at, this, at that time, he went through all that. Will the church easily forget everything that Jesus went through just because now he rose from the dead? Remember, a lot of things happened as he led captivity captive. It is out of that suffering. It is out of that conquering. It is out of that that he had done. That he now gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles. Out of that. And he gave some prophets. And he gave some evangelists. And he gave some pastors. He gave some teachers. If you happen to have been called to be a pastor, remember, it's not of yourself. It is the gift that Jesus Christ brought after he led captivity captive. If you have a gift in your hand, and you know that this gift was bought or purchased at the very cost of the blood and the life and everything that Jesus Christ had, that that gift came as a result of that winning that battle, you jealously got that gift. You couldn't have got that gift without God forsaking his only begotten son. Jesus had to go through all that. Not only that, apostle, very costly thing, prophet, very costly office, the evangelist, very costly, and the teacher. And the Lord has called us and given us gifts. But remember, the gift is not cheap. Now the pastor is mentioned here. And the pastor is not mentioned too often, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Why? Is that because there were not many pastors in the New Testament? Yes, there were many pastors. But I think we learned something from here. They functioned as pastor without flinging the label in front of everybody. Oh, they knew it's the gift that Christ had given to them. And they functioned in that office. But then they were not all the time talking about, this is who I am. 
They just demonstrated who the pastor is by what they did. And I think that is what the world should be seeing today. The world should be seeing that we demonstrate that we are a gift to the church by the functions we carry out. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Here God himself said unto Israel, he knew that there had been disappointment in Israel and on Israel. That their leaders or their pastors had not fulfilled all the functions that God expected them to fulfill. And here God promised and said, I will give you pastors according to my heart. And then he singles out, singles out the function that those pastors will fulfill, that will show that those pastors are actually, according to his mind, he said, they will feed you. Then he could have left it like that because many Old Testament passages, even New Testament passages, will just say feed the flock and will not specify as to what diet, what food. Are we, are we to feed the flock with? Here is very specific. Which shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28, Take it therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Again, you see the responsibility here of the pastor. The pastor is called to be a leader over a congregation of people. But then let us see how important, precious that congregation is. It's called the church of God. And it says that church Christ has purchased with his own blood. The gift is costly. And the church is costly. And you as an individual, you are brought into that situation to function in that costly office. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. The pastor is mentioned here, but again, not with the title of pastor. The title that is used here is that of a father. That's the picture. Oh, it says, you may have, though you have. Even if it were possible for you to have, that's the sense in which Paul the Apostle use, uses the language here. This doesn't mean directly, I hope you know, that 10,000 teachers were in the Corinthian church. And every one of them preaching to the Corinthian church. That will take so many years before it comes to your turn. You know, as we're here this morning, we're not up to 10,000. Do you know that? I don't think we're even more to, we're even up to 5,000. And when you think of 10,000 teachers in one church, teaching all the people, 
I don't think the pastor himself will have any chance to do anything. So this is saying, though ye have, if it were possible for you to have, even if ye had heard 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Here Paul the apostle emphasizes the place of the pastor. And he makes this comparison that the father for the family of God here locally. Or the pastor that is leading and feeding and loving the people of God here locally. It's very strategic. On page 12 in your notes. The pastor occupies a strategic place in the church. He is called to love the people of God. To encourage them. To feed them. To teach them. And to inspire them. And keep them in love and in commitment to the Lord. True to his privilege as pastor, he must desire to serve the people of God, and to meet the people's needs. He must desire to reveal and to manifest the grace and the mercy of God to those who desperately need it. And as pastor, remembering what Jesus Christ said, that other sheep I have, not in this fold, them I must bring, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd, because of that, this pastor will desire to lead sinners to Christ and to keep believers in Christ. And this pastor in the local church will unite members under Christ's headship and help the spiritually sick, poor, and oppressed to trust in God, to develop their faith, and to regain spiritual strength and victory. I read through that paragraph in such a short time, but doing it actually in the church, in the practical setting and situation, that is going to take the grace of God. The pastor cannot, and he will not, and he does not fulfill this ministry to the flock single-handedly. If you think about all these things that we have said here, loving, keeping, guiding, committing them, teaching them, showing or manifesting grace and mercy, and revealing the truth of God to them, serving them and meeting their needs, and leading sinners to the Lord, and making them to be united together on the headship and the lordship of Jesus Christ, and helping those who are spiritually sick or physically sick, and those who are poor spiritually and those who are poor materially, and those who are oppressed in every way, bringing them to love the Lord and trust the Lord and develop their faith, it is not something that one individual can do. That is why, more and more, as you think very deeply about the work of a pastor, you are going to begin to think all over again, pastoring a large, large church. When we talk of pastoring a large church, most people just think of preaching to a large church. But pastoring is much, much more, much, much more than preaching. A person can preach, and he may not be pastoring. And uh, you need to moderate the congregation in a way before you can really pastor them. Once they get to a large, large crowd, and they just come in there, and those people are so large, they are lost in the crowd, I doubt if you are pastoring them. So, whether the church is small or large, the pastor cannot do it alone. The pastor cannot fulfill this gigantic ministry of shepherding and fathering and pastoring. He cannot do it single-handedly. What does he do then? He prayerfully chooses others in the fold to serve with him in ministering to God's people. In his choice, he chooses by calling and character, not just by ability 
of each person. It chooses by much prayer and seeking God's face. Jesus had left that example for us before he chose people to support him. He prayed all night through. And it wasn't only that night he prayed. He had been praying before that time. And then he chose them. Let me just pass this in to your thoughts. He chose them after much prayer. And yet there was one Judas in their midst. He chose them after much prayer. And yet there were two brothers of the same parents. Sons of thunder among them. He chose them after much prayer. And there was somebody there called Peter that gave him a heartache at his most needful traumatic hour. The point is this. If all those people were in the team, after much prayer, what happens if you choose without prayer at all? Think about it. You are pastors. The way we raise up workers in the local church, leaders in the local church, don't get condemned because of mistakes of the past. Think of today and think of the future. God forgives the past, but he wants us to take care of what happens in the future. Therefore, in taking steps from today, as you see what Christ has done, that you will need people around you. You will need people that will support you in the work and take part and share in the work with you. Do it by much prayer, seeking after God's face. And after prayerfully examine others' acceptance of each individual. You see, when you, when you want to choose uh, people to help in the pastoral office, that is to compensate your own lack as a pastor, because you cannot see every need, you cannot touch every life, you cannot move everywhere, you cannot occupy every needful position, you are choosing these people as part of your pastoral staff, as part of the people that will support you, you will have to think about how other people accept these people. It's not just how they preach. It's not just the talent they have. You know, some people are greatly, greatly talented, but they're not accepted by the people. And therefore, you have to prayerfully examine other people's acceptance of each individual, determining their dedication to Christ. Determine their dedication to their specific ministry. Now what I mean by that is that when God calls you, he gives you a specific ministry. And sometimes you don't dedicate yourself to that specific ministry. And if you are put in that role to fulfill that specific ministry, and you are not dedicating yourself to that specific ministry, it's like nobody is there. You are interested in other things. You know, we know a lot of things, and we can do a lot of things. Maybe all of us here, we can do more than being a pastor. We can do more than being a teacher. We can do more than being an evangelist. But what is your specific ministry? We like to see people concentrate and commit themselves to their specific ministry. And love for lost souls. Consider the people that you choose in your pastoral staff to support you. What's their love for souls? And their willingness to serve without vain glory. To serve in the unity of spirit. And maturity in the way of the Lord. After prayerfully selecting these workers to serve and minister along with you, you as the pastor will carefully and constantly give direction to them and encouragement and you'll provide service opportunities what's the use appointing a pastor or appointing some people to work with you and they never preach they never pray for people you never give them the chance to do the work you have given them to do what's the use of saying i've got all these people around me and you are to do this, and you are to do this, it's on paper, or you have told them verbally, and yet you never give them the service opportunities. Make sure you give the service opportunities and inspire them to do it. 
offer correction, but offer hope at the same time in a balanced way, in a constructive manner. A real pastor will cultivate loyalty and trust and family spirit in the workers, not party spirit, family spirit, a sense of belonging, a sense of togetherness. Maintaining a forgiving spirit and an honest attitude with open communication channel as all get involved fully and freely in the work of the Lord in the church. We'll just consider two basic points on the pastor. Number one, the pastor as father and the pastor as shepherd. Before I go to explain, I want you to understand once again that this is a gift. It is not something we earn. You see, sometimes when we praise people, oh, we say, Brother so and so is a great pastor. Well, we may praise him as if he worked for it. He earned it. He developed it. Oh, I know that there is a part we develop. And we say, oh, brother so-and-so is a great, great, great pastor. Great love. Great understanding. Great wisdom. And we praise him as if he earned it. Remember again, it is a gift. And sometimes we talk about ourselves and we come into the church and we say, I'm your pastor. You don't have too many pastors, but I am pastor. I know it. Remember, you didn't earn it. He gave some. If he gave you and he didn't give that other person, bow before the Lord and say, Lord, I know I didn't do anything to have this. This is just your sovereignty. If you are different from the other fellow, who makes us to differ? We are what we are by, by the grace of God. You remember my story last night? The man who came to give testimony in that camp I spoke about, do you remember? I'm sure you will not do like that. You will not come before the congregation and say, I'm a pastor. I do it this way, I do it this way, I do it this way. It is a gift. And when you think about pastor as father, the world is aching. It's difficult to be a father. Those of us who are married, and those of us that have few children, and um, you see, it's difficult to have too many children. Let's say a person has 12 children. You will shout. You will say, how is it going to be easy for him to be a father? I mean, real father. Not just give them pocket money. Not just give them food. Not just provide where they're going to sleep. Be a real father to 12 children. But when you think of the pastor that has a congregation of 12 people, you say that's nothing. Oh, it's something. It is because we do not know the ministry of the pastor. The man that has 12 children is sleeping with them. He's living with them. He's waking up with them. He can take up the whip and whip them. He can dribble them. They bear his name. They can never run away from the house. If they run to the police station, police will send them back to this father. His work is simple. And yet we know that it's difficult for him to do it. And now we have a pastor. He cannot beat them. He can talk, but he cannot beat them. He, he can say stand up. If they don't stand up, he cannot box them. <laughs> he can quote Bible. He can preach. If they don't obey, he can only pray and cry and plead. What can he do? Oh, he has a difficult job. 
When we talk of pastor, we think that being a pastor, oh, we say, they just put me in a location where the membership is 50, and they say I'm pastor there. Well, I am there, but you know, it doesn't, I, I don't spend much time. There are only 50. You don't know the responsibility of a pastor. The pastor is a father, and a father has much to do. You are molding life. You are pointing the way to them. You are cleansing them every time. You are watching over them. You are sheltering them from the wolves. And a lot of things that could happen to those 50 people. And if you're a real father, the pastor is a father. You know, the pastor point two is also a shepherd. And as we think of the shepherd, we in Nigeria here, I think we have a little experience. You know, sometimes... Uh, I go on the road from IBTC while I'm going to the town. And I will see some people, they are trying to control one cow. And if you have seen them, they tie rope on that cow. And then somebody is going in front. Another person is going by the back. Another person is carrying a whip. Somebody is holding the tail. And they are trying to drag that cow in the right direction. And uh, the cow is stiffening the leg and pulling back. And they beat it and it turns the other side to them to beat. And they drag and sweat on one cow. Then, I have the privilege sometimes of seeing somebody. He has a water bottle on his neck. He has a staff in his hand. He wears a robe. And he's not, he's not a university fellow, but he's a shepherd. And he has all these cows, many, many of them. And all these cows are on the road. A vehicle is coming, and the cows go on sluggishly. They don't branch for a vehicle. And everything is filling the road. And the shepherd is uh, looking at you too. If you can control them, control them. If you are a shepherd, and you horn, and you do everything, and they are still there, and then you wind down your glass, you appeal to the shepherd, you say, shepherd, please clear the road. And then, he comes somewhere, he gently pats them like this, in a minute, the road is cleared. That's a shepherd. And it's not easy. And you cannot get up here right now and just go on the road and say, Shepherd, never mind. I want to take over. I'm coming from pastor's conference. <laughs> and they told us how to shepherd. Let me take over. If there's anybody here that does that, I appeal to that shepherd to give him chance. And let him take care of those cows one hour. You will resign. <laughs> it's not easy to be a pastor. That's what I'm telling you. Human beings are not cows. They have their mind. For somebody to come and bend their mind. They have their own personal private opinions. For somebody to come and change those opinions. They have their own life goals and direction they want to go. For somebody to come and change that direction and never make them angry. And just pat them at the back like this and they clear out of the road. And they go to the right direction. And to walk along with that shepherd long distance. Before they find grass that they're going to eat. And they find another shepherd on that side of the road and none of the sheep here will ever cross over here and you begin to fight with them saying that is my cow that is my cow for the person to be going in front and then all the cows and all the people will just follow after him if they find another person that come they never budge they never go in that direction to be a shepherd it is a gift of God and you know Sometimes uh, you will find, and it is still the gift of God, you'll find a particular family. It may be in the north. 
you will find that the child, the father, even the mother, you will find that all that family circle, they just know how to pastor, how to pastor the uh, animals. I read about a story. The president of America, not this present president, not even the former one, long ago now. He was president at that time. But he happened to also keep some cows and some animals. And in the night, they wanted to lead out this uh, a particular cow. And the president himself, you know, just got there and pulled on that cow and called his son. And the son pushed that cow. And, they didn't bulge, and the cow didn't bulge. Although even that president was the owner. And he kept them just for pastime, just for hobby. But they wouldn't, uh, the cow wouldn't yield. And then the maid, having cow sense, went to that cow and put her finger into the mouth of that cow, knowing that that thing would like to suck. And while that uh, cow was sucking that hand, then she was pulling the hand little by little. And because the cow still wanted to suck that hand, was following. And just like that, sucking that hand and pulling it, he went, got to the place where the, play, where the cow ought to be, what the president could not do. That made had the sense to do it. It's a gift. And when God gives you that gift, you can lead the people of God. And you know, since it is a gift, nobody needs to envy another person because the gift is available for you. And the gift is in Christ. He is the chief shepherd, the greatest pastor. And you can have him and have more of him. And he can make this gift of a father, this gift of a shepherd available to you. And how wonderful the church will be when God gives every one of us the gift of the pastor. I believe he will do it. Do you believe it? He will do it. Let's see the pastor, point one, as father. Let's look at this again. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. The pastor is referred to there as father. What does he do as father? What provision does he make as father? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Again, Paul here talks about being a father, being a parent. And he said he will still gladly spend and be spent for you. You know, sometimes when I look at a family, when I look at the prayer requests that fathers bring, I'm challenged. And you should think about it. Let me give you an example or two. And these are real examples. A father came and he said, Pastor, pray for me. I have a son. I sent him to school and this son is, is bright. When I was in the primary school, very bright. Secondary school, very bright. He got to university. I don't know what happened. He joined a bad gang. And they dismissed him in that university. Then I made provision for him to go overseas. And all the, almost all the money I have, I've been spending on him. When he got over there, he still was in the bad gang. 
And he came home on holidays. He failed all his papers. And then while he was here, he took some of the property in the, uh, in the house. And he just sold them. And some of the money that I have, he took part of the money and wasted everything. Pastor, pray for me that this child will change and will go back. I'm still willing to spend all I have on him, but pray that this time he will be reasonable. Have you had anything like that before? I said, have you counseled anybody like that before? They do not drive away those children. They go through all problems because of those children. They spend almost their earnings and living on that, ch on that child. And yet, even though the child is still incorrigible, they are saying, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, pray for me. I've uh, encountered some mothers too. Even this, uh, even this last week, a mother that had difficult, difficult child. And this child has done this and done this and done that. We don't know what we're going to do again. A sold property belonging to, uh, belonging to the family has done this, has put her name to shame. We go from house to police station, uh, from police station to the house. It's a very difficult thing. And the last thing they will talk about is that I want to kill that child. I want to destroy that child. Because of the shame that that child is bringing on the family. They say, all they're asking for is that you should please help me so that this child will change. They're still hopeful the child will change. And sometimes they'll bring them to you, or they do to me, and they will say, Pastor, well, the child is difficult. And when we come, uh, I don't want to act as if I've told you all these things because if that child knows, <laughs> that child, I'm telling you, Pastor, the child can slap me. Now, for you who are not real fathers, you see, and you're still keeping such a child in your house, that's, he's a father, he's keeping that child, and he's still hoping for the best. So he will say, Pastor, when we come to you, I will not talk much, but you are our pastor question him. And since I've given you background now, you will know between you and him how you will settle him. I know if you will pray for him, he will change. But I'm not going to talk much while he's there because that child is difficult. Even sometimes I've seen cases a child will take a knife and say, Daddy, bring that thing I want it. If you don't bring it, and Daddy will say, go and take it. And when they come to me, they ask him for prayer for that child. Sometimes a parent has a person that is mentally deranged. And this uh, father, he will come to you, even with all the shame and everything, all they are asking for is prayer. That's being a father. It's difficult to be a father. I mean, a real, real father. You begin to understand now how Moses went to the Lord. And after all those things they did in the wilderness, and God said, Moses, it's enough. Let me destroy these people and make you a great nation. You remember how Moses prayed. That's how a father ought to pray. Workers are not pulling their weight. That's the way a father ought to pray. The church is cold and the church is not following all the messages I'm preaching. There is a way a father ought to pray. It's a gift. Don't get discouraged. And the Lord will give us the gift in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, Paul the Apostle said, I will not be burdensome unto you, because I seek not what you have, but I seek you. You are more important to me, Paul the Apostle said, as my children and as the people of God, more than the property you have. For the children ought not to lay up any property or anything for the parents, but parents ought to lay down everything for the children. And let me ask you, 
our parents. You know, when, when, I, when I look at a father, and um, we, we have parents too, and our parents, they may, not be, they may not be people who are Christians, great, great Christians. Maybe some of us are fortunate to have Christian parents, but maybe the majority are not that fortunate. Our parents might not have gone to university or gone to, you know, anywhere. But our parents will say, the education I didn't have, I'm going to give to my child. Have you heard that before? Uh -uh. Why? Those of us who are fathers in the Lord, those of us who are pastors, why don't we say, as a pastor, I don't have this, but I'm going to allow my children to have. You know, sometimes you have uh, a, a father, is just a farmer. And as a farmer, this a father will go to the farm, come up and down, rake up everything that he has to be able to educate this child. Eventually, the child is educated, and the day that child buys a car, the father is not jealous that I spent all my earnings and all my life for this child to go to school, and instead of buying a car for me, he bought a car for himself. Does the father say that? Oh, the father will go through the village and say, my child has a car. My child has a car. And uh, when he comes into the village or the car, the father may not, where is he riding to? His farm, the road is not attached to his farm. So the, uh, the uh, car cannot go to his farm. Maybe the best they can do is just to allow the father to enter and drive him around the village. And that is all he says. Uh, then he prays for his child that enemies will not kill you. Enemies will not hurt you. This car, you will use it and you will use another car as fathers in the church. Fathers in the church. I seek not yours, but you. When our children have what we don't have, how do we feel? Be a father. God will give you the gift. That in your heart, in your life, in your outlook, you will be a real father. Then Paul the apostle said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more I abundantly love you, the less I be loved. I know some parents that uh, send prayer requests and they will say, uh, we love uh, so and so, our child. We're very, very fond of him, but we we'll never see him. He's traveled overseas and never comes back home. And even though that child does not write any letter back home to show that he loves them, they keep on loving him. They keep on loving him. If they hear that there is war taking place overseas, if they hear there is any problem overseas, they are thinking about that child. That's what we ought to do. I wonder whether we do that as pastors. Maybe the moment our own child crosses the door of our local church and he goes to attend another church for one week, we keep on throwing stones at him. The father will not do that. Father will not do that. I have known some children that maybe because of something happening in the family, he went to sleep in a neighbor's house. And what the parents will do is to be finding out, I'm talking to you about what I just encountered in counseling just a few weeks ago. What they will do is to be finding out where is he, where is he, where is he. When they discover where he is, they don't go with, you know, cutlass and, and clubs in their hands saying, we're going to finish everything today. They will go there and the father will be begging and pleading. That's the father. Until they bring that child back home. Recently I told the story of my boyhood Days. You know, when I was young, you like hearing stories, especially about me. <laughs> all right, that's all right. You know, when I was young, I did something naughty. What I did is that instead of going to school, I went to bury my books in one place. And then after I buried those books in one place, I went home so I could find something to eat. And there I saw my father. 
And uh, my father said, uh, what happened? Our school closed? I said, no, the school has not closed. Uh, they just sent us out of the school that we should go and get money for days and days and days. Uh, and it's even good that you're at home. I didn't know you'll be at home, but they sent us out. Uh, so, and my father, he was a small boy himself long ago before. He knew the tricks of little children. And he said, how much is that? And I gave him the amount. I said, it's this amount. So he, he took the money into his uh, purse. And then he took a pen knife into his purse also. And then he said, let's go to the school. <laughs> and while on the road, he took his knife and cut a particular stick and made it a fine stick. So that if we go to the school and what I said was not correct, instead of bringing money out, you'll bring the stick out. So we got to the school and he got the headmaster and said, this boy said this and this and this. And the headmaster said, we've been having problem with your child. Somehow he answers the register in the morning. But before the, during the school, is not there. And somehow, as the school is going to close, he still comes, and then he goes home at the, at the end of the school hour. And uh, we don't know what we're going to do with him. And my father said, do me a favor. And the headmaster said, what is it? He said, collect all the children together to the school assembly. And let me do something that this child will never run away from school again. And so they collected the school assembly. And then, uh, when they did that, they mounted me, and my father beat me more than the headmaster could have beaten me. It was bad, bad. And after he did that, I, I got all of that. I don't remember whether I cried or not. But I got back home, and I didn't talk. And the following day, my father said, now go back to school and make sure you don't do what you did yesterday. I said, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not going back to school. School finished. <laughs> and uh, my father said, what are you going to do? I said, I can be a farmer. So he gave me a cutlass, and we had a farm, and he sent me to the farm. As a boy of about 10, or 10 years of age. And I got to the farm, and I cut off all the all the branches and cut all the yam and all the cocoa, everything. I cut everything. And then I came back home. And my father got to that farm. He saw everything that has happened. He knew that somebody must stop this battle. And what to go the second time at that time was coming in. And he said, hey, my boy, please go back to school. Oh, I said, I've decided I'll be a farmer. No schooling. And my father was horrified. Being the firstborn, he wanted me to go to school. So he then called me and said, my son, I'm sorry that I did like that to you in the school assembly. I know that is the issue. Please never mind. Go back to school. I said, no, that's not enough. said, what do you want? I said, you, you need to give me the kind of food I like to eat. Rice, chicken, name it. And my father just prepared all the food and gave me. And then eventually, I got to school. Well, the reason I told you that is that if my father did not have that gift of a father, I would never have gone to university. Because I was just in standard one at that time, 1951. I might not have known how to read. But my father, with the gift of a father, yes, he had his mistakes that he made, but he had the gift of a father. He gently got me back to school. And I'm even ashamed of myself to say that that didn't change me completely. I still did some, I was not born again. I still did some little, little things. But my father had learned a lesson. Be a father. 
You understand? That's why Paul the Apostle said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. We have children in the church. We have workers in the church. We have people in the church. Let us be fathers over them. Because that is the calling. And that is the ministry that God has given every one of us as pastors in the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. From verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. That's the ministry of the pastor. That will be very careful as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own very souls, because ye were dear unto us. There is a difference between the school teacher and the father. The school teacher can give knowledge. In fact, most of the times, the school teacher can give more knowledge than the father can give. But then, the pastor, he may not have all the knowledge. He may not be immersed in the encyclopedia. He may only be immersed in the Holy Spirit. But the point is this. He may not be a data bank, as I said yesterday, to give you all the information and all the knowledge under heaven, but he can impart his very soul unto you. The teacher, on the other hand, may be able to give the gospel of God straight, sound, deep, but we need something more. The father, because the children are dear unto him, is able to impart his very soul if necessary. Let's see in verse 11. As ye know how we exalted and comforted and charged Every one of you, as a father, doth his children. As a father, doth his children. I hope you can see something in this verse. Exhortation and comfort and challenge. Look at the order. You give exhortation. And we do that most of the time. But sometimes the exhortation may be wonderful, sound, but a little bit sharp. And then, we never give comfort to follow after that exhortation. We will meet comfort and we give a challenge. And nobody carries out the challenge. Because there is no balance. A father will give exhortation. Then he will balance it up with comfort. And then, with that balance of exhortation and comfort, he's able to bring a challenge as a father does his children. Page 12, the note. As in Paul's day, so it is true in our day that there may be 10,000 instructors in the church, but not nearly as many fathers. There are many scholars and teachers but not many spiritual fathers. Each local church needs a real pastor who has a heart for the people of God and has real compassion for the needy. A leader who does not have the heart of a father will not manifest enough love, enough mercy, enough understanding, and consequently, he will fail to be a true pastor. The father's heart in the pastor will make him to have compassion, concern, forgiveness, sacrificial love in serving the church. Gentleness shall characterize 
every pastor in his attitude to the church, to the members, and dealings with the members of the church. Gentleness describes the loving, tender, fatherly touch that all children must have during their development. A pastor may be strong, but unless he has the balance of gentleness, he will hurt the people of God seriously. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. Wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, and gentle. We were gentle among you, even as Enos cherisheth her children, because ye were there unto us, were exalted and comforted you, as a father doth his children. A spiritual father in the house of God must develop gentleness. If we didn't have it before, let's remember the words of David, Lord, thy gentleness has made me great. Let us pray and plead before the Lord that he will grant us his own gentleness with the people of God. Gentleness does not mean compromise, but we need gentleness. A spiritual father in the house of God must develop gentleness. This attitude will allow him to teach even sensitive and difficult subjects without spiritually hurting God's people. Gentleness will cause the people to listen and to respond readily to the weighty and serious admonitions that a father often has to give. We sometimes think of leading the church as handling adults firmly, but we must always add the aspect of leading the family of God as nursing, caring, being gentle, serving, teaching, and loving members of the spiritual family. The pastor as a father in the family has to correct as well as counsel. He has to rebuke as well as love. That means as a father, correct, counsel, comfort. Don't just correct, 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 no comfort, no counsel. Rebuke and love. That means one rebuke followed by love. One rebuke followed by love. Another rebuke followed by love. And don't make those rebukes too near one another. You know, rebuke has a way of making a person feel that he has failed. We have to rebuke. The Bible says we rebuke. But the Bible also says that we love. What we're asking of fathers is that fathers will rebuke and love in a balanced way. That the children will not only be thinking about the rebuke, they will be thinking of both together. The responsibilities of the pastor demand balance. Balance like what? They say it on the outline, rebuke and love. Balance like discipline and develop closer relationship. You see discipline as a way of making a person far away from you. But make sure that you as the father, you will discipline when you have to, when you have to. But then make sure that at the same time you develop closer relationship. Let there be a balance, chastise and forgive. That is, you will sometimes need to chastise. Who, who of us did the father not chastise? Even though I spoke about my father chastising me in that hard way, that wasn't the last time he chastised me, only he tried to change his method. I don't know whether he did it consciously or unconsciously, but he never did that thing against me anymore till he died. So let there be a balance of chastisement and forgiveness. A balance of being forthright and yet gentle at the same time. A balance of teaching with authority. We need teaching with authority. Without it, as we had last night, the church will not be able to stand developed and established. We need teaching with authority, but with a heart of compassion. 
Pastors must nurture, love, admonish, be gentle, instruct, nourish, correct, forgive, chastise, be kind, warn, encourage, rebuke, comfort, speak the truth, be merciful. He does all that in a balanced way to develop and mature the flock over the which the Lord has made him overseer. God will give us the grace. Again, remember what we said yesterday. Who is sufficient for these things? Our sufficiency is of God. And we're able to do all things. Are we not able? We're able. We're able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He will strengthen us. Since it is a gift, and everything to make the gift available, he has done it. He has led captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Let's look at the pastor as a shepherd briefly before we close. The shepherd, the pastor as shepherd. In Jeremiah chapter 3 again, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I will give you pastors. If you look at yourself as clay in the hands of God, and for the remainder of this conference, you get into the hands of God, and you say, God, I know that I've been in the church, and I've been a pastor in the church, but I've seen the high qualification you require from the pastor. And I'm not up to it. As clay in the potter's hand, I submit myself unto you. Remold me. My question to you is, do you think it must take God another five years or ten years before he remolds you? Do you think it has to take the next five years? Oh, God can do in one hour what we have failed to do in 12 months. He can do it. And if today we will say, God, I put myself in your hand. I am clay in the potter's hand. You don't get discouraged. You don't say, why didn't I know all this before I ever started to be a pastor? No, nobody knew all this before he started being pastor. But you can surrender yourself in the hands of God. And then, at the end of the conference, God will give you as a pastor over that congregation back. And say, now I am giving you pastor. After my own heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Not just knowledge. Not just knowledge. Knowledge and understanding. You know, sometimes when you call, maybe if I call a district a pastor, and I give him a topic, and as, as he comes here, uh, because this is a large, large conference, and being a district pastor, he has never prayed to a large crowd like this. And uh, he says, my, this is a great opportunity. Let me convince these people that have studied Thompson Chain Reference Bible and have read Dicks and have read uh, Concordance. Let me convince them I have, uh, uh, what do you call it, Young's Concordance and Cruden's Concordance. And he brings long, long something. And before he came, I said, please don't spend more than one and a half hours. He said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Then he came. And he read Genesis, read Exodus, read everything. Didn't care that you were sleeping. Didn't care that you are hungry. And read everything. And then some people says, ah, 
they make this fellow just a district pastor. Why don't you make him a region overseer? This man has knowledge. But did he have understanding? A pastor doesn't, uh, you know, give you everything he knows. If little children are there, he has understanding of how to mix their diet. If the sick people are there who cannot chew bone, who are very, very weak, who need something to strengthen them, he knows how to prepare that thing. If there are people that are battered, people that are shattered, people that are discouraged, people that are afflicted, people that are oppressed in the church that Sunday morning, and he knows them, they love the Lord, but at this particular time, because of the many, many things that have confronted their lives, he knows, they, he knows that they are down. That pastor, he knows how to bring that knowledge and understanding together and give them something that when they go home, they will say, I thank God I went to church this morning. If I didn't go to church this morning, I would have remained in my, you know, depression and all the problems I had. And thank God for pastor. And when you compare the sad scripture of that day, the sad scripture will have more content, more knowledge, more fire, and more things that went into it. And somebody will say, I like the sad scripture. Why doesn't the sad scripture teacher become a pastor? living where he is is a good teacher let the pastor stay he has knowledge and understanding if we are going to pastor people we need the knowledge thank god for knowledge we need understanding you get what i'm saying and as you go back to the church and god is giving you back to your congregation as a real shepherd have that understanding. Have that understanding. And the wisdom of God and the love of God was the diet were given to them. We'll not have time to read all the references. I'm sure you're eager to read all these references yourself. Am I right? You will read them. Let me just read the notes to you. Some of the titles that designate pastors are father, bishop, overseer, preacher, minister, elder, shepherd. The word shepherd is a very descriptive title for the pastor. It describes the function of the pastor as that of giving tender, sincere, intimate, spiritual, loving care to the sheep in the flock. The pastor is spiritual shepherd, protects and guides and feeds the people of God. The shepherd feeds the sheep regularly searches out lost sheep, delivers captive sheep, gathers despised, uh, dispersed sheep, makes weary sheep to rest, binds and anoints hurt sheep, strengthens weak sheep, guides directionless sheep, carries the wounded sheep, restores the strayed sheep, reassures frightened sheep. Who can do this? Only God when he feels the heart of man. How can I at the same time do this regularly? Searching out the people that are lost. You see when the church is very large, sometimes you don't even know that anybody is not coming anymore. You don't even know that some people are lost. Or that somebody is captive. As um, one of our teachers and leaders said uh, during the preaching here, a Jehovah's uh, Witness has caught a particular fellow, or Seventh-day Adventist fellow has caught a particular person, and you don't even know anything that is going on. But you deliver captive sheep. And sheep, if they are being dispersed and scattered around, you are the one to gather them together again. And if they are weary, you lay them to rest. If they are wounded, you are the one to bind them up. And if they go astray, you are the one to restore them. If they become frightened, you are the one to reassure them. Who can do this? The pastor has to have the gift from God. If we have been thinking in the past 
that um, we can be pastor because we go to seminary. We can be pastor because we've come to IBTC. We can be pastor because we're reading a lot of books. We can be pastor because we've got knowledge. Let's change that attitude today. And let us know it is a gift from God. But you know, salvation is a gift also. But you got it. Didn't you get it? Sanctification is not something we earn. It's a gift, but you got it also. And the Holy Ghost baptism, the Holy Ghost baptism, it says repent and baptize in the name of Jesus. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You got it also. This one is also a gift. Just like the other things of God. If you've got healing, wasn't that a gift? 